Hi, uh, welcome everyone so on to the, our Quantitative Investing Festival. We should be starting really, really soon. And we're just waiting for the last few of our participants to be streaming in. And I'm sure I must be, uh, I'm, I must say I'm so thankful that all of you guys came in really, really early. And from what I'm seeing across the screen, I think, uh, wow, some of you guys were here as early as around 6.50. Yeah, so we're just waiting for the last few of them to be streaming in. Uh, that's why we'll be starting really soon. And of course, uh, today uh, we have Mr. Lim Ming Guan sharing a crossover with us on uh, more details about quantitative investing. So we, we should be starting really soon. Hey, hi everyone. Welcome. Welcome. And uh, wonderful to see all of you guys over here. And I see so many names and some of you guys were with us on Saturday as well. Uh, so many of you guys, I see uh, Daniel, Ching On, Edwin, and uh, wow, uh, Jing, I see all of you guys over here. Yes, I'm Bernard over here from IFAS. And thank you for coming in to join us on our Quantitative Investing festival and i know many of you guys uh, i saw your names uh, you were from uh, different schools and i see some of you guys are private investors investing your own funds as well and of course uh, today we are actually on to the second session of our quantitative investing festival and we are on uh, 14th of september and uh, if you guys have registered for the whole series of tickets you will know that our next session will be two days away from now of course uh, at the same time slots at 7 p.m. all the way to 8, 8 plus. Again, depending on how much questions you have for all of us and for our speakers. If you have not registered for the next few sessions, uh, no worries. If you look towards the right of the screen, we have a QR code over there. And that's where you can really uh, take out your mobile phones, uh, go on to scan that QR code, and you should be able to be registering for all the different sessions. And we need to let you know that uh, most of all the sessions, in fact, will be running it over Zoom and all of them are based on subscription links. So we will need your help. If you are interested in attending the next few sessions, uh, register and log on your details so that uh, we will be able to send you the uh, Zoom details nearer over to the dates. So yes, we have done uh, our last session on the 11th of September or Saturday. Uh, today is our second session and we are going to extend all the way downwards until the final day on the 2nd of October where we will be taking uh, panelist answers and looking at how to invest uh, 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 a pseudo amount of 100,000. So we are looking forward to seeing many of you guys all the way until the festival end on the 2nd of October. And of course, uh, for us today, uh, to kick off the whole uh, seminar series, uh, uh, Mr. Liming Guan will be uh, sharing a crossover with us details regarding about quantitative investing. You will be hearing a lot across from him uh, later. And of course, uh, so those of you guys who were with us on Saturdays, you, you have heard uh, many of them posting questions and answers along all the way. And of course, uh, just to let you guys know, uh, Alcorn has wonderfully uh, agreed to be our educational partners for this series of our festival. And we will be hearing a lot from them. And even later, uh, we will have uh, Patrick, Patrick over with us as well. Uh, Patrick will be hosting some questions and answers across from you guys. And I know uh, of your minds, many of you guys might be already having questions across for some of them. I will encourage you, you can always uh, type them in the Q&A chat. Yeah, and we will try our very best to answer you live. If we cannot, we may be typing in some of the answers over there. Or if not along the way, if we are not able to host all the questions, 
we will try our very best to follow up with you individually. Okay, yeah, so uh, I'm Bernard over here and uh, I'll be facilitating the whole sessions. And of course, uh, for some of the participants over here, uh, we know that you guys are not just as private investors. Some of us over here are actually uh, students from the uh, NTU Investment Interactive uh, Club and also from the SUSS Investment Groups. And uh, we will assure you, this festival is not just for all of us to learn how to invest our own money. But uh, within IFAS, we have always been uh, pushing out on our uh, CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. And one of our key CSR pillar is to encourage uh, financial literacy across the whole community. And of course, uh, for this uh, festival that we are going through, we will be actually uh, sharing a lot of education materials across the tertiary institutions as well. And towards the end of this session, I will encourage all of you guys, stay true because we will be having a short quiz and all these quiz answers will be coming together to form part of the mega lucky draw towards the end of the festival. And of course, uh, one of the top few prizes will be cost packages from our education partners or coins. Okay, yeah, so I think we, we already have uh, Mr. Lim already available with us online. Yeah, uh, hey, Inguan, uh, Bernard over here. Thank you for calling in. Hey, hi, Bernard. Okay, thank you for the wonderful uh, introduction. Yes, yes, and uh, I, I remember today you, you mentioned that you'll be sharing with us details about the quantitative investing, uh, probably a little bit of theory and also a little bit of applied methodologies. Uh, yes, I think basically what I'm going to cover like in the next 30 minutes is really touching on a high level, of course. I mean, you can't cover really like in depth or a lot of things about quant investing just in 30 minutes. But what I want to kind of highlight and let the people see is maybe uh, a brief introduction of what it is about and so that you can uh, understand its difference and as well as its advantages against, let's say, the mainstream investing approaches. And we'll probably also look at the current state and achievements of how the of how the quants right are actually doing in the industry today. And we also look at maybe like some of the myths surrounding quantitative investing. And finally, I'm gonna end it off by introducing a few interesting quantitative investing concepts and strategies that the retail themselves can actually also implement. Yep. Yes, wonderful. Uh, I, I think it'd be good if you can uh, start to share your screen, then we will we will sit tight to listen to you share. Uh, okay, okay, sure. Okay, before I start, I think I, I, I just do a little bit of self-introduction. I think some of you have attended the first webinar before. Okay, but uh, there may be those who are here for the first time. So bear with me for a while. This is really more for those who are attending the webinar for the first time. Okay, so my name is Engwan, as Bernard have introduced. I'm one of the co-founders and partners in Allquant. So basically, we're a company that specializes in educating the retail investors in quantitative approaches to investing. And these are not your typical, like your value stock picking, buy low, sell high type of strategies, but they are more non-conventional type of strategies that were adapted from hedge funds that we used to run ourselves. Okay. And aside from that, of course, we also actively work with other people in the industry, be it in terms of education or promoting and providing uh, more investing options for the everyday investors, just like what I'm doing today together with uh, IFAS Global Markets. And before starting all quant, I spent about 15 years of my career uh, across like asset management, banking, and hedge funds. I first started off as an investment associate right back in GIC, where I was kind of part of a team that was responsible for conducting investment due diligence on hedge funds for the purpose, of course, for allocating money to them. Then after that, I moved on to investment banks, namely Credit Suisse and Barclays. And over there, I was responsible for valuation control matters regarding like complex structured products as well as exotic great products that, uh, uh, that the banks actually trade with the institutional clients. And after that, I left the banks and I moved into prop trading for a couple of years where I traded interest rate futures spreads and some other stuff. And then finally, in my last role before setting up all quant, uh, I joined a local base hedge fund called Liquid Value Asset Management. And over there, I was running or co-managing a multi-strategy fund together with my partner, Patrick. Okay, who will be coming in during the Q&A later on. All right. Okay, so without further ado, let me share my screen. Then we can start with the today's topic. Okay.
Okay, so what is quantitative investing? Okay, now let's look at a very simple representation of the investment process. Okay, so we first have inputs or information that we use for making investment decisions. And what are some of these typical information sources that we usually use? Okay, for example, we may plow through things like annual reports. We may look at company fundamentals. We may also kind of like analyze how good the company management is. Or we may also sometimes watch news and see if there are any like potential market moving events, right? Or if we're not fundamental investors, we are technical traders, then we may be like looking at charts for patterns like your head and shoulders, your double tops and double bottoms, correct? Then based on all this information, then we're going to process it internally. Then we're going to come up with an investment decision. And the decisions are just simply uh, like what to buy or sell, when to buy or sell, and how much to buy and sell. Okay, now a lot of all this information, right, have a qualitative component to it. And it depends heavily, right, on how the individual actually interprets them. So for example, if you may be a technical trader and you may look at a chart, then you see a head and shoulder. Okay, but if I present the same chart, right, to another technical trader, he may choose to focus on some other pattern instead of the head and shoulder. Okay, even the very same trader, I can tell you, if he may actually choose to focus on a different thing when actually shown the same set of data at different points in time. So there is often, right, a high level of subjectivity involved here, right, in the typical investment process where the human element is involved. Now, the quantitative approach Right, is also similar in the sense that we also have the same three stages. Okay, but there are some notable differences here. And the first is with the data. Okay, data have to be quantifiable, or at least you must be able to convert all this data into something quantifiable. Why? Well, because machines are not good at processing qualitative data. So what quant usually makes use of are data such as like your price volume data, for example, the open, high, low, close, which you can download from Yahoo Finance. Okay, and they can also make use of financial metrics like your price to earning ratio or your price to cash flow. All right, they can also make use of economic measures, technical indicators, statistical data, or even alternative forms of data. All right, and the second difference is that instead of having a human, what we have, of course, is a computer model, right, that replaces the humans to process the data. So this model will represent kind of like a specific investment concept or strategy. Right? And it usually has very well-defined and tested rules, which you are going to apply consistently on the data to arrive at investment decision. So there is no subjective element here. You can fit the same set of data into the very same model any number of times, and I can guarantee you it is going to produce the very same outcome. Okay? And out of the models, there are many different types out there. Okay? So and each type actually... Uh, each can represent a certain type of strategies. Okay, for example, there's trend following, a very common model that's being used out there and something which I'll talk about later as well. So trend following kind of identify price trends typically using uh, technical indicators. And then they put on tricks that rise on those trends, right? Then there are also factor models, also a very common model that's adopted and used inside hedge funds that kind of help you build a portfolio, right? According to your preferred factor bias, for example. Uh, and let's say, for example, you want to build a portfolio of value stocks. So what you might do is, is to build a model that kind of scores the stocks based on the value factor. And then you might select the, uh, the stocks at the top 10% score to build such a portfolio. All right. Then there are also asset allocation models that can help you find uh, optimal allocation across like different assets at any point in time. And for example, you may want to find an allocation in a portfolio across different assets in such a way that this portfolio will give you the lowest possible risk, All right? So that's one example. Then there are also models that uses like machine learning to predict market movements or strategies that focus on trading volatility or strategies that focus on say arbitrage where they capitalize on mispricing between two securities. Okay, there are many more, right? And we'll look at a few of them later on. Okay, now, if I were to kind of summarized within a table, right? What are the different characteristics between uh, the conventional approaches? So conventional approaches is the discretionary approach here. And why is it called discretionary? Because the humans are involved, right? So decisions at the end of the day are at their discretion. So that's why it's called the discretionary approach. 
Okay, and then we compare that versus the quant approach. So the first thing is the discretionary investor, right? They tend to have a very heavy element of intuition in the investment process, which is shaped by their own internal experience. So for example, what they've seen, what they've been through, okay? And this is part of human nature, right? Quants, on the other hand, what we do is we rely heavily on hard science and math. So everything that we do got to fall back on hard evidence, okay? So uh, that can be eventually, right? translated into statistics and probability in order to support our decision. So if I have a strategy, right, I'm going to test it extensively using historical data to see if it works and how well it works right, before even considering using it. So that's one of the key difference and the first difference. Okay, now all of us, right, whether we are discretionary or quants, we tend to trade according to some sort of rules. Okay, but the key difference is this. Discretionary investors tend to follow a very loose set of rules that are internalized through their own experience and personality. And quite often, right, many of them, okay, even experts themselves, they cannot explain clearly or pin down their, uh, their decisions, right, down to the explicit rules that they use. So sometimes what we call it, we call it gut feel, all right? You can't really explain why you do that at a certain point in time, but you just did it. All right. But quants, on the other hand, we work only with very precise and well-defined rules that govern what we would do under different situations. So if the market is going to behave like that, we're going to do this, right? And if the market behaves like this, we are going to do that. So every single decision that is made, right, can be traced back and explained clearly. Okay, so this is the second difference. And the th third difference is very obvious. Now, since we call this group the discretionary investor, so humans are the central elements here. They make all the investment decisions or the final call, okay? So on the quant side, right, it's different, right? For on the quant side, data and model are the king. So they drive everything, including your investment decision. So that's the third difference, right? And because as a result of this, right, discretionary investors often face a lot of challenge in producing consistent results. Okay, I'm not saying that there are no good and consistent uh, discretionary investors around. There are, right? But for the majority of the people out there, this is a big challenge, right? Because there are a lot of human elements that are involved down here, such as your personal bias and emotions that can uh, affect your thinking and decisions. And every individual is different, right? So for example, I personally know a very good and experienced professional trader who has made a lot of money for himself and he actually tries to groom young juniors by kind of teaching them his own investing philosophy, skills, and knowledge. Right, but to my knowledge so far, right, based on what I know, right, none of them is actually able to do what he does. Okay, so there is a big challenge here, right, for uh, discretionary investors. Quants, on the other hand, we don't have such an issue, right, because we rely on what we rely on the models. And if we were to pass the same models to let's say 10 other different people and all these 10 different people are going to follow the model down to the dot, okay? I can guarantee you they'll get very similar results. So the quant approach is capable of producing consistent results that is repeatable because they're not affected by you no know, things like gut feel, your biases or emotions. Okay, now, so having said that, okay, quants and discretionary are also not 100% black and white thing. Okay, so many people actually fall somewhere in between. So someone who is 100% discretionary uh, is going to depend a lot on things like qualitative factors. So they're going to look at things like fundamentals, they're going to look at news, they're going to analyze the management, right? And there are also 100% quants, the really hardcore quants who really let math uh, data and model drive every single thing within the investment process. Okay, so a good example of someone who sits close to the discretionary end is going to be the Warren Buffett. So I, I'm sure everyone knows that, right? And on the other end, sitting on the corn side will be someone like Jim Simons. So Jim Simons, right, is the founder of Renaissance Technology, or well, they're actually the world's most successful quant fund. Okay, if you're not heard of Jim Simons, that means you're pretty new to quantitative investing. Okay, and now, where does most of you or the retail investors sit? Okay, you'll sit much closer here, right, to the discretionary side of things. So while quant, right, investing has been around for decades, right, particularly within the hedge fund industry, it, it is actually still very, very new when it comes to the retail scene. So there is a lot of scope here. And how are quants actually faring today in the hedge fund industry? 
right? So let's take a look. Okay, so while still relatively new to retail investors, Quan, as I mentioned, right, have been growing very steadily in the hedge fund industry. They have been around, right, since 2006. 2006 is the year where I first started joining the industry itself, okay? And till today, right, they have actually grown quite a fair bit. And this brought about by advantages of the quant approach I mentioned earlier, and together with like increasing availability of data, education, as well as advances in technology over the years. So when I first joined the asset management, right, they are still a very niche and small group, okay? And while I don't have the most recent data here, but from what I'm able to put back in 2017, it has already grown to represent like 27% of the number of hedge funds, right, in the entire world. And in terms, right, of the money or the total assets under management they actually manage, it represents an even bigger pie of 34%. Okay, I believe today they are having a much larger size today. Okay, and even though the quants may still be the minority today, right, they're actually punching way above the weight. So the top three spots in the world today, right, are occupied by quant hedge funds. So for example, we have Ray Dalio from Bridgewater Associates, then there is Jim Simons from uh, Renaissance Technologies, and then Cliff Asnes from Acura Capital. So all three funds actually manage uh, money right way in excess of 100 billion dollars and that is considered very huge in hedge fund terms okay and it is also not by chance that the world best hedge fund is also a quant fund okay so this is the medallion fund from renaissance technology which is run by jim simons so it has been in operation for more than 30 years since 1989 okay and the company hires like top scientists physicists uh, economies and mathematicians to actually develop their quantitative strategies. And no one knows exactly what they do, okay? But what we do know is the results. So they have delivered like on average uh, an annualized return of about 39% after fees, okay, for 33 years. So they've weathered through many bull and bear markets without a single down year, right? And this despite the fact that they actually charge a ridiculous management fee of 5% plus a performance fee of 44%. So this performance fee means that aside from the management fee, right, for every single dollar of profit that they make for you, they're going to take 44 cents away as their share. Okay, so if you actually reverse out all these fees, this fund actually made about 70% per year in terms of gross profits. Okay, but you're thinking of investing with them, sorry, then I got to disappoint you because they're so successful, they've actually returned all the external money back to the investors and they no longer accept any new investments, okay? And so the only way if you want to join them or invest in them is to, I guess, is to join them, right? Because they only accept internal capital, all right? Okay, now let's take a look, right, at some of the main surrounding points. I've seen and heard about these many times, okay? Uh, you know, people like to make comment and jump to conclusions almost on anything you can find, very often without basis. Okay, so let's take a look at what are some of these. I, that's the first myth, okay? Quant strategies are black boxes. Now, if you don't really understand anything, then it is going to appear as a black box to you, okay? But what I can tell you is this, right? Most of the quant strategies out there are not black boxes. They're actually built on sound and solid concepts that are well understood. So you can ask any competent quant about the models they actually run. And if he is willing to share, I'm sure he can tell you down to the details of how the model is being built, how the model works and why it works, right? He can probably even tell you how the model is going to perform under different types of market conditions and what is the overall expected long-term returns as well as the possible downsides that he can actually face. So in fact, if you think seriously about it, uh, black boxes are not the models, but the humans themselves, right? So because most of the time it is the humans that really can't explain why they make certain decisions. So it is almost never the models, okay? But the second myth is that you actually need to be a rocket scientist to run quantitative strategies. Okay, now there are indeed complex quant strategies that do require like deep and heavy knowledge math, okay? But they don't represent the entire universe of strategies out there, okay? You can leave those strategies to the PhDs. I mean, no issue at all, okay? But many quantitative strategies actually aren't all that complex, right? In fact, what you need is some basic understanding of math, probability, statistics, and most importantly, 
a good dose of your common sense. Okay, that's a very important thing. Okay, for example, even a simple technical trading system, like let's say based on moving averages and your relative strength index can be considered a quantitative strategy. Okay, you don't need a PhD to do that. Okay, so that's the second myth. And the third myth that people often like to talk about is that uh, they think quants are actually losing control to the machines. Okay, I think quite a number of people will find this relatable because we humans often pride ourselves as being superior and we think that we should be the ones in control. Okay, but if you come from the perspective of a quant, right, like myself, it is entirely another different picture, right? So I build the models according to what I want, correct? And I know down to the nuts and bolts of what the model is and how it is going to behave and the results that I can expect from it. So to put it simply across, these models are just doing what I wanted them to do, right? So in that way, how can that be even considered as losing control? So quants are not losing control here, right? To put it simply, we are just simply using the models as an extension of ourselves, right? And the outcome right, of this extension is a strategy or a specific model that is pure in focus, right? Focus on a very specific task that they need to do. They're very disciplined and stripped out of bias and emotions. And this is very important if you want to be consistent and successful in investing itself. Okay, so this is the third and the final myth. And now what I want to talk about is modeling itself. Now, for a quant, right, the cornerstone behind all quantitative strategies is actually the backtesting or the modeling process. So this is the process whereby investment strategies are conceived, built, tested, validated, and deployed. So contrary to what a lot of people think, right, it is actually not a simple process. No, it is not a game also. It is actually a highly uh, rigorous and, re and elaborate process in order to ensure the best probability of a positive outcome. Okay, so let me just roughly take you through the process itself, right, at a, at a high level. So usually what we do is we usually start out with a concept. So you may get like ideas from internet, reading a journal paper, or technical papers, or you may form a certain opinion or idea, right, about the market by observing what is happening. Okay, uh, the first stage, what you want here is a sound and understandable concept. Okay, and after that, what you want to do, right, is to plan and get hold of the data that you require to kind of build and test all of this idea yourself. So here, what you would do is to collect the data. Then after that, you need to clean it up. By cleaning, we mean addressing things like missing data or errors in the data. And what you want to do at this stage is to secure clean, reliable data that are sufficiently long enough, right, to cover like different types of market conditions. So this so that you can see how the model actually behaves under different regimes later, and then you're able to trust right, the results that come with it. Okay, and once this great data is ready, so what we're gonna do is move on to build the model and set the logic and rules of the strategy in place. So, and these days, right, there are many options that we can do it through like different uh, platforms out there. So if it is not resource intensive, you can actually just make use of even like Microsoft Excel, which a lot of people are familiar with. Or if you have more expertise, you can also program it in things like Python or R, which has a lot of uh, extensive libraries that you can actually use. Okay. And this stage, right, is largely going to involve us building and optimizing the model's parameter with a set of data while reserving, right, another set for testing purposes. So what we want at the end of the day, right, is a model that is stable against reasonable parameter changes. And from there, you will see the first cut results of your idea, and you can use it to further refine your concept, right? And then collect the data you need again and test it again, okay? And once the model, right, is done and ready, you're going to move on to analyze its performance and behavior. For example, you're going to ask questions like, are the results good enough, right? Is it statistically valid, right? Are its behavior in line with what we're expecting? Does it offer, let's say, a good fit with our existing portfolio, right? And are there any other ways uh, that we can improve the models further, right? And once we're satisfied of the strategy, usually we don't deploy it straight away. What we do is we put it through what we call a forward testing stage or paper trading stage. So we basically run the model forward for a period of times. And why do we want to do that? Because 
This is important to help us catch problems like operational issues which are not captured right within the back testing and also to help prevent what we call overfitting issues. So an overfitted model right tends to break down rapidly when deployed. So during this forward testing stage, what we want to do is to ensure that a model behavior, right, still holds. Okay, and once all the stages are clear, then we're ready to deploy the model live. But even then, we still have to constantly monitor the model for potential signs of breakdown. All right, so this is the nutshell, right, is the back testing or the modeling process. Okay, and why do we take such pains, right, to go through such an elaborate process? Because Building models actually gives us a lot of insight into our own ideas and it helps to validate them, right? Because at the end of the day, what we want is to make sure we have the best probability of success. So a good backtesting process is going to help you answer a lot of questions. For example, does my idea even work at all, right? And how much can I make on average, right? How much can I lose and what is a maximum loss I can expect? And did the strategy behave in line with my expectations? And when, it do, when does it do well? And when does it do badly? What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? And is it a good fit right, for my overall portfolio? So back testing will help you answer all these critical questions itself. Okay? And for those uh, who are still at this point, let's say skeptical about the usefulness of back testing and modeling, right? Uh, because we often hear people say that history is not a guarantee of future performance, right? So that's not totally untrue, but you've got to understand that back testing is never about finding guarantees, okay? It never, because there are no such thing as guarantees in the market. Okay, for those who still are skeptical about this, let me leave you with this thought. If your idea or if an idea that you think about does not even work in the past, then think about what is your basis for it to work even in the future. Okay, for quants like us, we don't take things like, I think, I thought, maybe it will, it should, no, as answers. Right, because the market is not going to do what you think simply because that is what you think, right? What we want are evidence, statistics, and probability to support what you think and what you thought, all right? Okay, uh, what I'm going to do next now is to move on and talk very briefly about some quantitative strategies that we ourselves used, right? And we can see how they actually fare against, let's say, a buy and hold position in stocks itself. Okay, the first strategy that I'm going to introduce here is called the all weather strategy. Okay, some of you may be familiar with it. So uh, Ray Dalio from Bridgewater Sausage actually runs a $50 billion all weather fund based on the very same principles. And this principle is actually called risk parity. Okay, it's the theory that is very well grounded in modern portfolio theory. And it actually also contains a lot of common sense okay so now risk parity is the term that the industry used if you want to understand it from a layman perspective right then uh the best term to describe it is balanced and a balance about what it is balanced about risk across the different assets okay and why is balance that important here because risk parity works on the premise that we cannot foresee or predict what the markets will do so the best approach is to actually diversify it across a good mix of assets and then spread the risk equally across each asset. Okay, and know that what we're spreading out here is not a capital one, but the risk, right? So this is one of the key difference between this approach and other conventional approaches like your 60-40 or your equal weighted approach. And another added benefit about this approach is that because risk itself, right, is a market-derived parameter, the portfolio allocations will adapt itself to changing market conditions, okay? For example, during a bear market, it is going to allocate less to stocks and more to bonds. And during a bull market, it is going to increase its allocations to stocks and reduce its allocations to bonds, All right? So I will talk, I'll have a more in-depth discussion or session to talk uh, more about the weather strategy later on. I think it should be next week in one of the sessions. But basically for now, that is the gist of it. And if we were to look at this performance here, right, uh, it may seem a little bit unimpressive in the sense that it's delivering a lower return than the US S&P 500 over the period considered from 2005 all the way to uh, 2020, end of 2020. But what you need to note here, right, is the risk level or the volatility, right? It is actually way lower than S&P 500. So it may achieve a lower return, but it do so at a far much lower risk, 
right, of 7%, which is less than half of what the S&P 500 uses over here. So if we were to compute its efficiency in terms of the amount of returns you generated using the risk level taken, the all weather strategy actually delivers about 1.25% of returns for every 1% of risk taken. And this defined here right, by this term called the Sharpe ratio. Okay, and it is more than twice, or it is almost twice, right? What the US S&P 500 achieved, right? In terms of Sharpe ratio over here. And if you zoom in, right, at these two circles here, so these two circles actually mark the, the first circle actually marks the great financial crisis from 08 to 09. Okay, and this second part here is the COVID-19 pandemic, which just happened uh, last year in 2020. And during both these crises, you notice the all weather strategy actually managed, right, to stay ahead, right, with minimal movements. So this is the kind of stability, right, a pure investment in a stock market will never be able to give you, right? But yet at the same time, right, uh, the all weather strategy still delivers you a good and decent returns, okay? The returns is not like a low return of 3 4%, which you can achieve with bonds, right? But rather high, in fact, I would say at about 8.7%. Okay, and note that no leverage is being applied right here. And the performance that I show here includes all the transaction costs. Okay, so the next strategy that I'm gonna to introduce to you is called the trend following strategy. But it's also a very well-established strategy that's out there. Uh, it has existed around for decades. And this is the bread and butter strategy, right? For commodity trading advisors or CTAs. So CTAs are, uh, a form of like funds itself, pretty much like hedge funds. So if you do a search uh, on your Google internet and type in CTAs or your commodity trading advisors, you'll find a lot of information about them. Okay, trend following, right, is largely based on the empirical evidence that price right, moves up in trends, be it up or down. Okay, and most of the rules that are used to build such a system are usually a blend of technical trading rules and risk management rules. And in our trend following system that we use, right, it is all about riding winners for as long as you can and then cutting losers as soon as you can. And because it reacts to trend changes, right, it in a way it also adapts itself to changing market conditions. Okay, so the thing about such system is that you sometimes see a lot of like small little losses, right? But at the end of the day, what we're pulling is a long-term game. Uh, so that is the long-term is more important. And over the long run, you see a lot of huge winners and your huge winners are going to make a lot more than what you lose with all those small little losses, right? So trend following often follows what we call the Pareto principle. So about like 20% of your trades are going to account for like 80% of your profits, all right? And how will such a system perform? Okay, so this is the model performance of our trend following strategy, which is applied right to the US Dow 30 stocks, okay? And in comparison, uh, the orange line, what we have is the performance of DIA, which is the Dow Jones Industrial Average ETF. So you see the print performance actually mirror fairly closely to the stock markets. Okay, and this is, uh, this is actually sensible because when the market is in a good trend, the strategy tends to hold on to the stocks and ride on it for as long as you can, right? Uh, and it would do so, right, until it establishes that the trend is turned, right? And that happens once during the great financial crisis in 08 and 09. So during that period, right, the stock market actually hated down. Well, and the strategy starts to kind of unwind its positions gradually after establishing a downtrend on each of the stocks. And at one point into the crisis, you can see that the uh, that the strategy is almost entirely flat with zero positions here, right? So that's you, that's why you see a flat line uh, for the trend strategy while the stock continues tanking. Okay, so this defensive mechanism is what helps the trend strategy manage its risk and outperforms the market over the long run. Okay, and the performance statistics actually reflects it, right? So in terms of its drawdown, yep, this is what saves it. So the worst drawdown for the trend following strategy is uh, minus 18%, while against minus 47% for the DI ETF itself, right? Okay, and... The final strategy that I'm going to kind of talk about for today is called the volatility risk premium strategy. So volatility is an asset class itself, right? And it is not new. So institutions have been trading volatility for a very long time. Okay, but the retail investors, I believe it may still look fairly new. 
And indeed, it is also more complex and riskier than your traditional asset classes. Okay, but with the right strategy and the right uh, risk management methodology, such a strategy can actually be very useful in terms of complementing your overall portfolio, right? So essentially what the strategy does, right, is to try to capture the difference between the implied volatility and the realized volatility. So implied is what the market expects, okay, what we are pricing in into the future and is currently reflected in the option prices right now. So it is about the future, okay, and realize, right, on the other hand is what actually happened, right? And realized volatility is calculated based on historical data. And the difference between these two, right, is what we call the volatility risk premium. And based on this measure calculated uh, using the premium and some other considerations, we will determine whether we should take a long or a short position on volatility itself. Okay, then overall, the strategy tends to produce a return stream that is fairly uncorrelated to all asset classes, be it stocks, bonds, commodities, or others, right? And on top of that, right, it has the potential to act as a very good hedge while against major stock crises. And it is capable of offsetting losses on your stock position significantly. So let's look at how it performs, right? So this is the model performance. Okay, its performance is fairly high, but at the same time, do note that it is also a volatile strategy here, right? It is not like your all weather strategy. Okay, and usually we do not advocate anyone just running the strategy alone by itself, right? It is best used to complement other strategies because of this unique return profile. So what I'm gonna point out here is that uh, is this behavior during these two particular major crises, right? The great financial crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic, right? So if you look at it, the strategy not only did not lose money during this period, in fact, it profited immensely during the crisis, right? Because what happened is that during both periods, the strategy actually turned long on volatility, okay? And volatility surged right up during those crises. So this strategy actually can serve as a pretty good hedge, right? For our portfolios and potentially protect our capitals, right? In the times of like extreme stress, all right? Okay, so we, with this, I kind of come to the end of what I wanted to share for this session. I hope I give you a good breath and introduction uh, as to what quants are and what they do. Okay, and we'll be sharing more information and topics throughout this entire festival all the way to the 2nd of October, 2021. And also for information, uh, you can actually also build your portfolio using some of the strategies that are introduced today, right, through uh, IFAS Global Advisors. Uh, market advisors, the Bernard. And for a more detailed uh, detailed information or in-depth discussion, what you can do is you can scan this QR code to fill up a simple form. And after that, iFast Global Markets will get in touch with you for a better discussion, right? To understand your needs and see whether the solutions actually fit you or not. Okay. And right now, I believe it is about time for the quiz. Okay. And for information, it's just two simple multiple choice questions, which I think you can do in like less than two minutes. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass it back over to Bernard, right, to help administer the quiz. So all the best to you, and I will see you back at the Q&A after the quiz. Okay, uh, Bernard, back over to you. Hey, Inguan, thank you for sharing so much just now. I must say I love it when you share about the uh, various strategies available. And again, it's not just uh, theoretical in nature, but I think we saw you doing your backtesting and especially, especially sharing across with us how it performed during the year 2008 uh, crisis. Yeah, wonderful to, to, to see all these things. And as well, I've promised all of you guys, uh, we, we, want, we want to end off the session with, uh, with a, uh, a quick quiz. Yeah, two simple questions. And later, we are going to run through the Q&A. And I must say that I always see some questions coming in. There are probably four or five coming in, some anonymous as well. Uh, no, no, no worries, send your questions. We will be asking on your behalf if you have left it as an anonymous attendee. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so Ingo, I'm just going to take over the share screen over here. Okay. Uh, wonderful to see see all of you guys uh, with us. And as what we mentioned, today is just the second day of the uh, festival. We are going to have a, quite a few series of uh, sharing going on. 
And if you would like to achieve a bit more clarity in the portfolio that was shared, I will encourage you to come by for our 16th of September festival. And again, uh, we, we are only going to send the, uh, the Zoom link over to the registered individuals. So if you have not registered for the next few sessions, uh, do take out your, your mobile phone, scan on the QR code, and we will be able to be uh, sending the links across over to you. So thank you, uh, Nguyen, for the uh, sharing just now. And as what well, we shared, uh, there, there will be uh, some quizzes going on. And all this quiz, the main aim is just to recap what we have learned from each session. There will be just two very simple questions. And for all of us to get ready, I will encourage you, bring your mobile phone out because uh, we're going to have a short quiz something similar to what you, you, you do on your many adult learning sessions. Uh, power up your phones and push them out over to the uh, QR code sessions. Yeah, so, so that we, 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 are, we will be able to share that across with you. And yes, uh, wonderful. I, I think our Ami has already pushed out that QR code. Scan this QR code on the left to join. Or if not, uh, you can just type in this URL, URL ahaslikes.com uh, forward slash uh, capital X S7 M1. Okay. Yeah. So, so click, let's, let's just click, click, click on this code and uh, you should be able to uh, join. Let me just do it myself as well. Uh, I, I must say that I, I will want to be winning some of the prizes, although I'm not sure whether they will qualify me personally for, for the quiz or not. And once you get it, you, you might be able to see that there's this thing called ask, ask a questions. Yeah, click on that. And uh, we will need a little bit of help because in order to register you, we need your name and uh, that type your question over here. If we, if we need a little bit of help, just put in the last three numbers of your NRIC or maybe your FIN number plus the alphabet so that we are able to track you across onto the, uh, onto the various uh, seminars that we're having. Okay, uh, once, you are once you are ready, I think uh, admins, uh, our admin team behind, once you are ready, please start, start the, uh, the uh, questions. Okay, and uh, once ready, our admin team, uh, please let us know. Yes, there are two MCQ questions over for, for, for each quiz. And each, each of the questions, you have 60 seconds to answer them. And I will assure you, they are definitely not difficult at all. Okay, yeah. Well, you can see uh, we already have 44, 44 out of our 200 attendees who are already online. Uh, I know sometimes it can be a little bit challenging get, whipping out your iPad or your iPhone, uh, but do join us if you can. And uh, thank you for all the emoticons from all our participants coming in. Okay, uh, I, I think I'll, I mean, it should be ready. Let's, let's move on to the first questions. Okay, and, and as what we mentioned, uh, key in your last four characters of your IC or your passport number, email your fins, your name and your email address so that we are able to be sending the prizes over to you. And I will assure you that uh, we are not using any of these things for marketing efforts at all, okay? Yeah, once you're done inside, just click on the blue color submit. Yeah, and that's where we will be uh, moving on to the next questions. Okay, let's 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 move on to the uh, to the questions, and I will show you just two two quick questions and sixty seconds each. Let's uh, start the quiz. Okay, so the key part of what are the advantages of quant investing? Is this the MCQ? Yeah, so there are a few answers available. You don't see the uh, options over here because it's right on your phones. Yeah, you will see on your phones. There are some questions asking whether well, it's based on evidence, statistics. Is it based on precise rules or is it based on uh, data models that drive the investment decisions? So you have one, one and two, one and three, or even one, two and three. 
why am I seeing some sad faces over there? Yeah, uh, I'm quite sure it is it is easy enough for all of us. Just 16 seconds to go. Yeah, we'll be showing some answers in a, in a quick while. I'm sure you guys can answer this. Okay, just, just a few more seconds to go. No worries. Uh, okay, yes, let's start revealing the answers. Time's up. And yes, uh, it's actually one, two, and three. And we have a majority of people who have answered this correct. Wonderful. Yeah, so just to give you the right answer, the advantages of quant investing is that it's based on evidence, it's evidential base, statistics, uses precise rules, and there are data and models that drive the investment decision, which is all three of them are actually correct. Okay, so yeah, let me help to progress onwards over to the next questions. Okay, the second question. Yeah, take, take your time. Uh, there, there should be around 60 seconds for you to be looking at it. Okay, the question, which of the following is true? Yeah, you will see it on your phones, but likewise on the screens. Yeah, maybe the first one, all quantitative strategies are black boxes. Is this true or is this wrong? Or maybe next part, uh, we need to be a PhD or rocket scientist in order to be running quantitative investing strategies. Or maybe the third one, uh, quants lose control of their strategies to the models. Or maybe you might even think that none of the top three are even true at all. Okay. Yes, we just have slightly less than half a minute for you to complete all the questions. Wonderful to see. I think most of you guys should have keyed it in already. Yes, just the last three seconds. Let's reveal the answers. Wow, yes. Wow, everyone got it correct. None of the above. And that's, that's, that's wonderful. I think uh, Ingwan correctly mentioned to all of us, they are not black boxes. Yeah, a lot of time, uh, quant investment strategies are models that allow us to be back testing, forward testing, and to be able to see some details. And you really need not be a PhD or rocket scientist in order to be doing that. Because uh, most of us over here are not PhD holders. And yes, uh, we still have full control of the portfolio, even when it is actually rent. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you to our admin team on the background who's actually running this uh, sharing. Okay, I'm just going to uh, move on slightly ahead to, to help us to move on into the Q&A sessions. Uh, yes, and I think we have Patrick across over with us. Mr. Patrick Link, he has just joined online. We're part of the panelists to be uh, answering some of the questions that we have. And wow, I see, I see quite a fair numbers of questions over here. And uh, if I just run down some of the lists, some of them might be a little bit more interesting uh, crossover with us. Uh, I think we mentioned about backtesting just now. Uh, I will forward this question across to either of our panelists, whoever are, are ready to share that. We mentioned about backtesting, and there's one question over here to mention that which markets are the backtesting done on? And will it be done? I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, just merely on the US market or global markets, or maybe are they specific to any, any exchanges? Yeah, any of you uh, in Gordon and Patrick? Uh, okay, I can answer that. So uh, those models that I've shown uh, in, in, in the presentation early on, they're done mainly on the US markets. So for example, the all weather strategy, they're done on the US markets, but they are across different asset classes. Okay, so there are uh, stocks, there are bonds, there are commodities, there are real estate. Okay, and we use ETFs just to generate them. So we don't kind of like buy the individual securities. Okay, and then for the vol, is using the volatility ETF also with respect to the US market. And then you see the trend following. Okay, the trend following one is US markets, but we are applying that strategy specifically on the Dow 30 stocks, the individual stocks. So that one is not on ETFs. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so <clears throat> maybe just one, yes. Maybe just to add on. Huh? So, mm. um, when it comes to backtesting, right? So one of the very important thing is that uh, you must be able to, first of all, find um, suitable securities for you to use in the strategies. That's the first criteria. And then the second criteria is that you must be able to get clean and reliable data on these securities. So um, we, have, we have ever done backtesting on other markets as well, but we usually run into these two problems, right? So the first is where can we find suitable 
instruments to use for that particular country. And as well as the data, usually the historical data for some of the other countries outside of the US, right, are either missing or they're not reliable. So there are some challenges in terms of getting data. Lah. So that's why we focus most of our effort on the US market. And for very good reason as well, because for quantitative strategies to work, right, one of the very necessary ingredients is that there must be liquidity in the market, right? Because most of the time we want to be able to enter and exit our positions without moving the market. So that is why the US market is a very suitable uh, market for us to employ quantitative strategies on. And of course, the other reason is that the US market is the most developed financial market in the world. And they have a lot of products, new and up upcoming products that is constantly innovating, right? To allow us to be able to gain access to the different various types of asset classes out there. Yeah, so for this reason, we are focusing much of our effort on the US market right now. Thank you. Thank you to both our panelists for sharing about this. So I, I can hear that there are various reasons why some of the markets are being used specifically more towards the US market and not because of just, just because it's, it's, it's the United States, but rather there are more sophisticated instruments and are more data available. Yeah, and a crossover to our panelists, there's also another question regarding about the same part of back testing. Uh, uh, is, are there any actually probably a uh, fintech-based platform that, that you're actually using for such uh, testing? I, I did hear, I think Ingwan just mentioned in his sharing that uh, it can be as simple as using an Excel spreadsheet to be running some of the modeling and testing. So maybe just to hear from you guys, uh, what are the industry level? It might be software platforms or maybe simplistically, uh, I, I did hear Ingwan mention just now, very simple Python uh, programming that I'll be using as well. We will be able to elaborate a little bit more into this area. Uh, okay, maybe you can go first on this. Okay, the strategies that I actually just showed you can actually be implemented using Microsoft Excel. Okay, you may not believe it, but they can be done. Okay, and within the industry itself, there are actually billion dollar funds especially the trend following funds, the CTAs, which I just mentioned to you, they are also running their models based on uh, old legacy Microsoft Excel spreadsheets. Okay, because the models themselves are not all that uh, complicated, right? So they can actually be done quite easily, right? Using Excel, if you actually know how to do it itself. Of course, if you can translate them to Python, it can even be easier because Python can probably do the thing, right? In probably a few lines of code, so you need like tabs and tabs and pages of Excel spreadsheet to do exactly the same thing, right? But the good thing with Excel is that uh, you get to see the entire logic of your model being built from front to back. Very easy for you to kind of trace and look at the at the results, right? And make sense of what is happening out there. So everything is there. What you see is what you get. So with programming languages, of course, there will be the syntax that you actually need to kind of pick up on yourself. Then after that, you will probably need uh, the debugging, right? It's also maybe one level higher. You probably need to kind of generate an output then take a look at what is wrong here and there before you can actually figure out whether the model is actually working according to the way you want it to, to do, all right? Then of course, then, the industry itself also uses a lot of like hardcore languages like C++, right? For those that really uh, go in depth into like high frequency trading, right? Where speed is of importance. Uh, so in those type of industry, then it's a different ball game altogether. It's beyond like retail, right? It's beyond definitely beyond retail level. Even for small hedge funds, there are no way to kind of like compete with those giants out there to go and uh, to go into those fields itself, right? Because those you need to have very sophisticated and powerful hardware, you really need to get the elite programmers right, to go and program efficient lines of code. Just one additional loop that you need to do or one additional line of code that, uh, that the machine need to pass, you may actually lose out to your competitor, right? So those would be a different ball game altogether. But for most people, I mean, Excel and just simple Python usually is more than sufficient, yeah. Anything, thank you, anyone thank else? You. Thank you, Inguan, this, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that fully answers the questions. There are definitely expensive platforms available, but many of the data can be simplistically managed with a few lines of coding. Maybe the next question, uh, along the same direction, I'll direct that over to Patrick, especially because, uh, Patrick, you, you shared that uh, some of the markets are being used, especially in the US, because they do have some instruments, especially ETS, that may portray some of the characteristics 
that what you may be interested in in the models. We'll be able to share a little bit more. How do you use ETFs in, uh, in such modeling? Okay, so um, I mentioned earlier that ETFs allow uh, us to gain exposure to other types of asset classes apart from stocks. So that is one way that ETS can help us to build a more resilient portfolio. Um, another way is that um, you know, nowadays a lot more uh, sophisticated ETFs are also coming online. So we get uh, you know, simple um, ETFs that try to replicate simple quantitative strategies. So things like smart beta ETFs, we, have, we even have trend following ETFs that's coming onto the market. Now, um, I cannot vouch for whether these strategies are actually good or not because I don't use them myself, but I can foresee that one day we might really have an ETF, right? That is really very good um, in terms of replicating hedge fund strategies that becomes available to the, the retail market. And then I think that will really give the professional hedge funds a run for their money. Right? But I think that will probably be still some way off. We won't see that uh, so soon. I mean, reason is very simple, right? I mean, if, if the person who is able to create that ETF, he, he will probably be better off running a hedge fund rather than creating an ETF, right? So, um, yeah. So, yeah, another, another way that ETFs can help us, right, is that, um, um, you know, sometimes for us to uh, run certain strategies, right, maybe might require typically an institutional investor to adopt uh, futures. That means they need to use futures in order to run the strategies. But they are actually ETFs, right? They replicate the exposure to the futures. So basically what happened is that the, the issuer for the ETF, right? They will go to the futures market and they will actually buy the futures and they'll, they'll do the rolling whenever the futures expire, right? So in other words, they're creating a synthetic exposure using futures. So for the, for the buyer of the ETF, right, doesn't have to bother with all this mechanism behind how the futures market work and all that, but they can also gain exposure to the futures market. Now. Yes, thank you for sharing about that. And uh, I think I, I definitely have heard uh, many of such instruments. Some of the example, I think uh, VIX, VIX that, that has a reflection on volatility and uh, mention about futures. And I, I did remember, I'm not sure whether you are using it, but USO or uh, uh, United States oil, which always has rolls over the, uh, the future part on oil, on crude oil. Yes, thank you for that. And uh, I, I think I saw another question that was on, uh, uh, on the chat asking regarding about how much the portfolio size. Uh, I think I, I'll just quickly answer that because in this cooperation between all quant and uh, IFAS, uh, we are really harnessing on each other's uh, efficiency and all quant comes in as an education partner while IFAS comes in as a platform. And as a platform, some of the, uh, the uh, quant investment strategy that we have ran across our client can start from as low as approximately 10,000 US dollars. But of course, we know that that would be very limiting in terms of what we can be doing. Uh, normal average, we do see the range of uh, generally 100,000 USD and above. But uh, I would like to suggest for many of us over here who are learning up, uh, I think a very simplistic uh, portfolio of to around 10,000 USD would be able to be, at least for you to be sampling, to be trying out uh, this whole methodology. Okay, and uh, I, I must say that we are limited in a little bit of time. And let me just take the last question, which I thought is pretty interesting. Yeah, and that we address across both our panelists over here. We have seen a lot of men in the loop in creating this whole modeling. Yeah, in the whole, whole quant investing. Uh, I, I think that's a question regarding about AI, artificial intelligence, about machine learning. Uh, would, would there be some point in time whereby AI and machine learning comes in to be part of uh, handling or even managing such portfolio? Or maybe uh, across all of you guys, are you using any form of uh, AI and machine learning in, in your work in quant investing? Okay, uh, I can go first on that. Okay, so AI is actually, uh, on machine learning in general, there's a very, very large area, okay? So I don't know whether you're familiar with regression, linear regression. So linear regression is actually a form of machine learning itself, okay? It's a very, very basic and simplistic form of machine learning, and it is extensively used in factor models. And hedge funds have already been using factor models for a very, very, very long time. Okay, so if you want to technically speak about it, actually AI of machine learning has been there for, for quite a while. Okay, and 
But of course, there are a lot more models nowadays from those that are uh, a little bit more transparent, those that you can properly decipher all the way down to some of the AI, I may even classify them to become black box, okay? So I said before, like most quantitative strategies are actually not black box strategies, but there are certain classes of AI strategies such as neural networks or some, now they call it deep learning because of the multi layers of uh, neurons that you need to process through. Okay, those type of models tend to be uh, what we call brute force classification models, right? That tries to kind of like search out for patterns within the data that you actually submit to it. Okay, but, but the thing is, it is by itself just a classifier. You can feed it a lot of irrelevant data and it will still try to find some pattern for you. Uh, so this is how the AI classifier works. Okay, but the big challenge here is your, the value of the data, right, is limited by itself. I mean, so how well the model eventually is going to work uh, uh, is a lot restricted by how much information the data you supply to it has. Okay, so that's one of the key limitations here for AI itself, right? But yes, there are a lot of like hedge funds out there that have really been trying to apply AI uh, to use it in investing itself. I'm not sure about their success. Okay, personally, yes, I have tried it out myself as well. Okay, there are certain, uh, I would say there are certain reasonable efficiency in terms of using AI if you kind of find the right group of data to feed into it, but the results are nowhere as stable as I would like it to be, all right? So that's my own personal findings here. And that is one of the, also one of the key reasons why I have not really deployed an actual AI uh, model into our strategy yet. Yeah. So yeah, Patrick, you want to add anything to that? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so basically AI and machine learning, right, uh, is, I would consider it still very much a frontier technology. Mm -hmm. So it is still very much um, in the infancy stage. Huh? So whether it will eventually succeed or not, I think it's still too early to, um, to say definitively whether there is a case or not. But right at this moment, right, there are basically some, um, I would say, uh, some sacred cows, right, that, that this AI and machine learning is in a way flouting like, in terms of the quantitative uh, investing philosophy. So one of it is that, um, so you know that AI and machine learning, right, is all about uh, the programmer or the person who's developing the, the, the method methodology, right? It's basically just passing reams and reams of data into this neural network. And the person who's developing it can't even tell you like what exactly is going on in that neural network. So meaning to say that um, if you ask him to explain how it works, right, he's probably not going to be, be able to give you an answer. The only intelligent thing that he can tell you is that, oh, I fit in this, uh, this data stream into this model. And I think this data stream probably has some influence on the outcome or the output that the model is going to give me. So end of the day, if you think about it, isn't it like going back to the realm of discretionary investing, because at the end of the day, he's still making a very, um, I would say a predictive statement, right? I think, I think that this data stream has, has a predictive power over this model. So that is the first thing that I think it's uh, not, in, not really in line with the quant investing philosophy. La. Now, the second thing which I think is uh, flouting the quant philosophy, right? Is that once you have a model built, uh, you shouldn't, but you shouldn't really change the parameters on the fly. Meaning to say that, let's say I move forward uh, in terms of the time period, right? Now, the next period, I realize that, oh, if I tweak this parameter, I get a better historical performance. Then I'm going to change that parameter and use it going forward. Now, this is what we call changing the model on the fly. So when you do that, right, then it becomes like you are trying to uh, overfit the model. But this is exactly what uh, AI and machine learning is trying to do, right? Because Ultimately, what, how, it, how it works is that the, the data stream right, is always being fed into this, this uh, neural network, and then it's always on a moving forward basis. So whenever it receives new data, right, whatever, whatever things the neural, uh, the neural network is trying to fit, right, it would keep changing on the fly. So that is the second thing that I feel is not really, um, I would say, in line with the quant philosophy. Lah. So obviously, it is still a very new thing, uh, and I wouldn't want to discount that and say that it doesn't work for sure, but 
right at this moment, I think I'm still not fully convinced that AI and machine learning is something that is able to help us. But I think the question here is, if the AI and machine learning were to develop further, right? Yes, indeed, there is a danger that one day machines can take over and the humans really have no more understanding of what the machine is doing or even how it works. So in the event that the machine breaks down, right? Then again, the human cannot say, oh, it's not working anymore. I'm going to kill it. So there is no definitive way in which you can overwrite the machine's output basically. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick and Ingua, for sharing all this. Yeah, and I must say that uh, we are coming to an end of today's sessions. I saw that there are still probably five or six questions that we have not answered, and I must apologize deeply on this portion. But I can say that uh, some of them are def definitely much more technical details, and I will assure you, in the next few sessions, on the 16th and the following week, we will be coming in to answer some of those technical uh, questions. So thank you, thank you guys for uh, joining us. And uh, we, we, we really hope to see you guys uh, coming in for, for the next few sessions on the 16th on the 18th of, uh, of September. And we're going to come to the end to us today. And thank you for, for being across with us. And we hope to see you again. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.